Awesome. Thank you. Um, it is, uh, I'm going to just stop screen sharing for a second and um, <clears throat> say it's great to be here at the Linux Foundation. I am a Linux user going back to the early 90s when you would, I'm dating myself here, but when you would download a giant pile of, of floppy disks to install Slackware 0.8 on your machine. And I think one of the awesome things about, you know, the last 20 years in computing has been the rise of open source operating systems, open source languages, uh, the, the ability to build things without being captured by uh, some commercial entity who, um, uh, you know, who wants to um, uh, uh, just kind of maximize revenue from you, but instead it's a, a collaborative effort. And, and that has really defined, in my view, the last couple of decades of computing. Uh, a little on me, um, I am now the chief architect at SNEAK. Uh, SNEAK, S-N-Y-K, stands for So Now You Know. It, we are a security company, uh, started out as an application security company. Uh, but uh, with the acquisition of Fugue, which is the company I founded along with my co-founder, who's here today, Andrew Wright, um, we're extending um, into the cloud as well. So, so our perspective is to have a single view of security from the application all the way through uh, the deployment, et cetera. I'm not trying to give you a sales pitch, just trying to tell you a little bit about uh, where we're coming from. Um, Prior to founding Fugue, I'm a longtime programmer and software architect. I was the CEO and CTO at Fugue in various phases of its development. Um, but mostly, I'm interested in building secure systems from a developer perspective, um, not uh, as much from the, the kind of after the fact security perspective. We believe that most breaches, and we're gonna get into in great detail, some real breaches today. We're going to, as, the, as, as it says on the tin, we're going to deconstruct them. Um, you know, th those breaches are very much concerned with the, the, the cloud control plane API. And so that'll be the focus today. Um, as uh, Linux Foundation mentioned, we love it when there are questions along the way. So uh, we will have some time at the end. The session will be about 50 minutes, give or take. Um, but if there's something you want to explore or challenge or, you know, uh, uh, all I've been doing for about a decade is cloud security. Uh, something you want to dig into that I'm not digging into, uh, go ahead and, and throw it up there. And, uh, and Drew is going to help me keep track of uh, what you guys are, what you folks are, um, are looking for as well. So, all right, I'm going to go ahead and share my deck. I promise there aren't too, too many slides. We're going to spend a lot of time at the whiteboard and looking at uh, things like DOJ filings and such uh, for, for these breaches, but um, we do have a few slides. Okay, so the, the way hackers act and what hackers do is what security needs to be about. It, in a, in a, a practical world, Right, we, we often in security think in terms of like, you know, risk management and so on. And those things are good, you know, we need to do that. But what we're really concerned with is what hackers are actually doing. And so this session is about, that's very much our philosophy at Sneak is we look at, you know, real breaches, uh, real hacks and uh, devise ways to protect against them, which is, which is, I think, the only practical way to go about this. So um, there have been some huge changes due to cloud computing technologies versus the data center that have obsoleted most data center 
uh, forms of security and protection. So if you look back at the old school data center, um, you know, it, it says hardware here. Obviously there's hardware in the cloud, but you're not touching it. So in the data center, you're procuring hardware. You're going through some, uh, you know, change control board process or some other process where you're deciding which hardware to run for performance, for cost, and for security. Um, you're doing that manually. You know, someone needs to go and slide something into a rack, plug it in, configure it. And that means the environment is relatively static because there's a ton of friction in that process of buying stuff, racking and stacking it. It has a, uh, you know, typically a three or a five year recapitalization cycle. So, you know, your server named Frodo is going to be sitting out there for three years and you're going to be trying to maintain it. Um, and when I say you, it's typically uh, some kind of dedicated, you know, operations department more than the developers in the data center. The developers might give requirements to them, but they are not procuring things and bringing them online in the data center. There's this high friction manual process that goes on. All right, and the scale, even in really, so a, my, a little on my background uh, again, um, I kind of split my career between national security kinds of environments and high tech companies. So uh, I was at AWS before founding Feud with Drew. Um, and uh, there I was the principal uh, solutions architect for Department of Defense and some intelligence kind of world stuff. Uh, so I've seen some very highly secure and very large environments. And they tend to be only in the scale of thousands of components, um, which is small in the cloud world. That's very small. And they tend to be of a small number of like types of services. And by a service here, I mean a server or a router or a network attached storage device or a security appliance. Uh, you can typically count them, you know, they're in the, 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 the few to low dozens, right? Well, when you go to cloud, things really change. They almost invert. Um, in cloud, the hardware configurations are driven by software. Uh, instead of it being a scenario where you get some hardware and then deploy software, you write software that deploys hardware. And it's all API driven, it's all programmable and done well, it is highly dynamic, meaning your footprint is gonna change a lot as the system runs and evolves. Uh, you're not on a three year recap cycle, you're on a 20 second API provisioning cycle. And what that means is that developers and DevOps are creating the actual infrastructure. And by the way, this is how most cloud breaches happen, is, is not through operating system exploitation, although there's often a component of that, it's mostly through the configuration of these cloud resources. So scale hundreds of thousands of components. So Fugue, uh, Fugue is now part of Sneak, uh, Sneak acquired us in, in February uh, to create this whole security vision of the, the, the entire system, this ability to see the entire system. Uh, but few on its own was already managing millions of cloud resources for our customers in financial services, a whole lot of uh, 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 high growth, high tech companies, but millions of resources. And uh, of hundreds of types. So when you think about any given resource in the cloud, like a, a container or a managed relational database or a uh, managed tr uh, video transcoding service endpoint, all of those things have their own APIs. 
And that means all of them have their own types of exploits. And you cannot base your defense strategy, your security strategy on uh, TCP IP network defense because it's mostly useless in the cloud. There, there's, there's a little to gain there, but almost nothing. Okay, and hackers have changed how they operate. We have this labeled as pre-cloud and cloud, uh, kind of hard to know if coincidence or causality, but it is largely coincident in time. Um, the pre-cloud version, kind of the Hollywood hack version, is you know the hackers pick a target, and this this still happens. Um, you know, some famous examples are the Sony motion pictures hacks by the North Koreans. You know, they, 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 the Sony made a, a movie they didn't like. And so they went and, and, you know, what hit the press is all of the executive emails they had breached. But they had gotten into just about everything in that, in, in that network. Uh, so you pick a target, search for vulnerabilities. Often those are executives. Often those vulnerabilities are humans who are over permissioned and that you're, you're fishing them or doing some other kind of social engineering. And then your exfil tends to be relatively low and slow. Uh, you're trying to go unnoticed. You're trying to remain resident in the environment. And so you might do things like exfiltrate records from a database in outbound DNS requests or similar. Uh, that is not what we see anymore for the big, like high profile, you know, CEO gets fired kind of breaches in the cloud. That's just not how they're happening. Uh, it's, it's radically different. So what the hackers are doing is first and foremost, they're searching for vulnerabilities on any public facing uh, endpoint, IP address, DNS record, et cetera. So, and they're doing this almost instantaneously. So by the time you put something on the internet, you've probably got just a few minutes before one or another uh, groups of hackers have noticed if you have any vulnerabilities. So the, the preferred methodology now is to run automation on these endpoints. And this really is enabled by the cloud because the, the, the cloud providers, the hyperscalers, you know, Amazon, Microsoft, Google, um, their networks within their clouds are so fast and so high efficiency that um, this is, this is a, 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 an inexpensive thing to do in time. Um, so the, the hackers are searching for vulnerabilities. And we know, for example, the Capital One breach happened this way. And I'm, I'll go into a fair amount of detail on Capital One in this session. Um, and then the, the hacker gets kind of a menu of stuff that's vulnerable that they can then go try to see who it is, right? Like stuff that they know they can exploit because their automation has told them there's something exploitable. And so from that menu, they'll pick a target. This is vastly more efficient than trying to do some kind of like social engineering stuff, right? There's no humans in the loop here. This is full automated hacking. And then the exfiltration is, is just smash and grab. There is, there is no need or want to stay resident and, and do slow exfiltration because you can't tell that it's happening. And what that means is detection is almost useless in the cloud world. It has to be prevention. All right, we're actually going to go through um, all the named breaches here today. So Twitch suffers massive 125 gigabyte data and source code leak due to server misconfiguration. Boy, is that a misleading headline. And uh, 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 if you pay too much attention to these headlines, you will uh, not be aware of, of where your real vulnerabilities lie, where, where the real risk is. Um, yeah, misconfigured servers contributed to more than 200 cloud breaches. Misconfiguration can mean a lot of things. Uh, very often in the press, the, the journalists like something pithy and short that 
lots of folks can understand. And, and that's, you know, understandable. That's kind of their job is to disseminate uh, what's happening in the world in a way that people can, can grok. But very often it hides the complexity of what's really going on and therefore um, how you need to defend against it. But misconfiguration can mean everything from leaving like a port open that is a dangerous port. You know, that's a very simple misconfiguration to fundamental design and architecture flaws in the system that allow massive blast radius effects in attacks, okay? And the, the industry and the press tend to focus on the former, the simple stuff, where the latter, the bad design, bad architecture from a security perspective is actually uh, how people uh, really get harmed in these things. Uh, that next headline, the Capital One breach is more complicated than it looks. Yes, <laughs> yes, it was. Uh, we'll go through this in some detail. Uh, Twitch breach highlights dangers of choosing ease of access over security. Uh, it's a reasonable headline. Um, but, uh, you know, the specificity of, of what is being spoken about there um, is where it gets interesting. And we'll, we'll get into that. Okay, um, how far are we in? We're like 20, uh, 18 minutes in. Okay, I'm gonna speed up a little bit. So control plane compromise, uh, almost all cloud breaches, I say almost all because there are probably some I'm unaware of. Um, every cloud breach I'm aware of at scale uh, follows this same pattern, which is there's some form of initial penetration. It might be something like, uh, a dangerously open port or a, uh, a very often an orphaned uh, piece of infrastructure, a uh, virtual machine or a container that people have forgotten about and therefore has developed a, a CVE. Um, you know, API keys are the king of cloud hacks. And sometimes people put those in source code in places that they should not. I would argue never have them. If your Git repo has API keys, uh, you, you're inviting disaster. <laughs> so, but that initial penetration is really just to get a foot in the door. Like nobody cares anymore if they can flip your operating system. Nobody cares anymore if they can root a virtual machine. That doesn't really matter. What matters is getting access to those control plane APIs, the ability to do things like list S3 buckets, like, like issue get commands against S3 buckets in a privileged way. And so to, to get from point A to point B from, okay, I got in to some compromised server. In the case of Capital One, it was probably uh, a self-managed web application firewall that had slight misconfiguration to it. And uh, that's all the press focused on, but the real hack happens after that, which is from there, I need to go discover what you have that's valuable to me. And uh, this is gonna be a theme. 90% of hacking is learning. Uh, it, is, it is not attacking, it's learning. It's understanding the environment. And so your goal as uh, anyone building a system, um, I think this is at least as much on the developers as on the security team, is to uh, prevent knowledge from the hackers. Uh, but once they do that discovery and movement, they'll find something valuable. In the case of Cap1, it was like 700 S3 buckets. We'll look at the DOJ filing in a second here. Um, and then uh, typically smash and grab exfiltration, like sudden exfiltration. All right, um, let's talk a little bit about what we think of at Sneak as the five fundamentals of cloud security. Um, the first one is you have to know your environment, okay? Um, just as the hackers are trying to learn what you are doing, you must know what you are doing. And this is a non-trivial problem, right? It is uh, it, it, going back to, uh, where were we? Uh, 
yeah, hundreds of thousands of components. So knowing what that environment is doesn't just mean knowing a list of them. It means knowing how hackers might approach them and whether or not those things are uh, kind of configured in a way that um, uh, is vulnerable to those kinds of breaches and, and particularly around limiting blast radius. I'm gonna keep coming back to this. You cannot prevent initial penetration across the board. You can't. It is not possible. It, it is a, 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 a fool's gold. Um, it will happen eventually. But what you can do is design your systems in such a way that the discovery and movement is highly limited and that the data extraction or other kinds of exploitation are limited as well. And by the way, we've got a whole series of classes we're teaching now on uh, doing this through things like controlling uh, for time, for what actions are available, for what resources can be breached. But this talk is a little narrower on just um, deconstructing some cloud breaches. So let's go ahead and deconstruct some cloud breaches. I'm going to stop sharing while I get my screens sorted here. And uh, have we had any uh, any questions? Not, none yet. Get okay. them in when you have them. Yeah, go ahead and fire away if you have any questions. Uh, let's see here. I'm trying to find the right screen. Here we go. And we're going to switch from the deck over to my browser. Are you seeing a uh, DOJ filing group? Yep, can see it. Cool, cool. So this is the actual, um, you know, United States District Court for the Western District of Washington at Seattle complaint against Paige Thompson, who was the Capital One hacker. Um, so this goes back to 2019. Uh, it's still highly relevant. There have been no huge changes to uh, cloud platforms that can prevent this kind of thing. Um, the beauty of this one, and by the way, I'm going to use real breaches. I'm going to name names and use their actual uh, content. Um, these are some of the best companies at doing cloud security in the world. I'm going to do Capital One, Twitch, um, uh, Imperva, and if we get if we have time, I'll get to Uber. But certainly the first three are among the best companies at doing cloud security. So uh, this is not an attempt to say, uh, you know, ha ha kind of thing at all. These, these folks are brilliant at what they do. Um, but it's super interesting to look at real world cases versus abstractions because the abstractions are always uh, overly simplified and therefore nearly useless. So we have to look at the real things. All right, so I'm, I'm skipping ahead a bit here. Um, uh, kind of what, it, what it's said to date is that Capital One got this uh, uh, email telling them, hey, somebody's on social media bragging that they hacked you. And this is an interesting first point. Uh, that's how they found out. And it was, it was weeks or even a couple of months after it happened, uh, I believe when um, when they actually learned of this. And that includes, in this case, AWS, their cloud service provider. Like no one noticed it when it was happening. And there's a very good reason for that uh, that we'll get into. Um, so they get this email and then uh, there is a, 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 a file, a collection of data that the hacker has shown the world for bragging rights um, saying, uh, you know, these are, these are the things I did uh, to do this breach. So uh, there were four commands, according to uh, this DOJ complaint. Um, uh, the first command, when executed, obtained security credentials for an account known as something-waf-role. Okay, so the press picked up on this as meaning that a WAF a web application firewall was exploited 
particularly, and that that was the cause of the breach. AWS came out and said that was a tiny piece of it. Um, but the important point here is uh, what matters is security credentials, not residency on the server. I mean, you need that maybe, depending on how things are configured. But once you have the credentials for this WAF role, it says then in that in turn enabled access to certain of Capital One's folders, they mean buckets, at the cloud computing company, they mean AWS. All right, the second command, uh, list buckets. So, so, so the, the WAF role is an IAM set of credentials. Uh, if you're new to cloud, IAM, identity and access management, is the principal network that you're gonna care about regarding access to cloud services, APIs, and data. It's not the TCP IP network. That, 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 that is almost never, I've never seen that be the mechanism of exploitation in the cloud ultimately. It's always through um, identity or similar, like security group access, things like that. So those credentials are the goal, not the server. Who cares about the server? The credentials are the goal. And those credentials had the ability to do a list buckets command. Now, a lot of times, you know, in Fugue, we have like a special rule that tells you if you're running things, uh, compute resources in the cloud that have the ability to list storage locations, because that is incredibly dangerous. Going back to, you know, the slide on discovery and movement. Well, if you can just do a list buckets, and in this case, get uh, 700 bucket names. Imagine if you had to guess those or uh, winnow them out of some other resource. Um, it's just a, a really convenient way for hackers to uh, understand the topology of your system. And, and you really want to prevent them doing that. So this comes back to app dev. This comes back to the system design. You should not have in your system design, the need for components of the system to list storage locations. They should know them in some other way. Okay, and then the third uh, command here was the sync command. And when executed, uh, it used that WAF role to extract or copy data. Okay, well, sync is part of the AWS CLI. It's not actually an API endpoint for S3, but it is part of the CLI. And what it does is it first lists and then calls gets on objects, okay? S3 is the world's largest web server in the sky. It is probably a third of the internet, uh, something like that, at least a fourth, trillions of objects hosted in S3. And S3's job is to extremely efficiently store data and allow access through gets of that data. You, 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 you're gonna do puts and things like that too, but mostly activity on S3 are gets. And this explains, I think, why this was very hard to detect because S3's job is to host a bazillion gets a day, however many you have coming in. And therefore a 700, you know, reading each object once out of S3 with get commands is not going to stand out in a signal to noise kind of kind of way. All right, we're at the bottom of the hour. I'm going to switch to this Twitch hack. All right, so if you're not familiar, um, the Twitch breach uh, was last last year. Yeah, last year. Um, and, and what happened is uh, a hacker got in through what was likely a orphan piece of infrastructure. And with Imperva, we'll see it was definitely an orphan piece of infrastructure. Uh, but when that hacker got in, what they did is get 125 gigs out of uh, GitHub source code repos, including source code for literally everything Twitch makes and source code for, Twitch is part of Amazon, right? If anyone should be able to do uh, AWS security, right? It should be Twitch, right? So, so and, and that is not 
I'm, I'm not saying that to disparage Twitch. I'm saying that to let you know that you are probably more vulnerable than they were, okay? These are deep, deep experts on this stuff. And, and the, the flaw here was really a combination of a minor misconfiguration and a design flaw, just like in Capital One, that the design flaw in Capital One was the ability to list buckets. Doing the get commands was actually, the actual like data exfil was uh, trivial, right? Just a pile of gets. The important part of that breach was the ability to get the list of things to get. And similarly in the, in the, in the, the, the Twitch breach, uh, the problem here is blast radius, not initial penetration. If you think you can prevent initial penetration, you are wrong. Uh, there are people who can get in to your system somewhere. And so your job is really to limit the damage, uh, to, to minimize the blast radius. All right. Um, so uh, this quote in particular that I've highlighted is, is one that kind of drives me nuts. Um, this is as bad as it could possibly be. How on earth did someone exfil 125 gig of the most sensitive data imaginable without tripping a single alarm? You cannot have good enough alarms. That is the wrong idea. Uh, if you're trying to do that, you will fail. The hackers will win. What you have to do is have a system design and architecture where you're not providing them the ability to do things like this. And what that means is really limiting access to sets of data. So uh, I'm going to switch to a whiteboard here for a sec. I think I've got time for that. It feels like I have time for that. It's uh, not what I want. This is what I want. Okay. Drew, are you seeing a whiteboard? I am. Yep. Okay, cool, cool. So over here on the left, we've got a hacker. And let's just think through what we what little we know about Twitch, right? We know a whole lot more about Capital One because there's a DOJ filing and there's a script and commands. But you've got some server, let's assume for a moment that it's an old school virtual machine. And some vulnerability has been found on this, allowing uh, the hacker to uh, gain access to that uh, compute instance, to that compute instance. But what they steal is a bunch of stuff in source code repos, and also, by the way, a bunch of user data. So we don't have all the details on this, but how I imagine this probably happened is that somewhere there was a database that this server uh, connected to that might have had things like user data. You know, famously, the press uh, focused on like, oh my God, uh, super popular Twitch, you know, channels make millions of dollars a year. I mean, we all knew that, like, so what? The nasty stuff was uh, what they breached from the GitHub repos. So you're, you're gonna have, you know, SCM repositories, Git repos with all of that source code. And, and I'm, I'm highly suspicious that uh, I don't believe that the same GitHub repo that held some AWS native service uh, source code, which we know from the reporting on this. And I mean, you could just go download uh, this 125 gigabyte archive off of, off of 4chan uh, where the hacker posted it. Um, this has got to be numerous Git repos. So, so, how, so what I'm interested in is not really like where am I? Uh, is is not really this like that could be anything that could be some kind of uh, CVE uh, unpatched operating system a uh, you know a, a log for shell it could be all kinds of things and again you have to assume that every compute instance that has seen air no matter its composition. Uh, although uh, VMs and containers are more vulnerable than serverless functions, for sure. But anything that has seen air, you have to assume is compromised if you want to prevent these kinds of breaches. 
what I'm interested in is how in the world were all of these different Git repos as well as likely databases then accessed? In the worst case scenario from a, you know, a, a Twitch decision-making process, there was an IAM role attached to this that actually had access to do all of those things. Uh, I cannot think of any reason why uh, the same identity would have access to source code repos and to production databases. It just does not make sense to me. So I'm skeptical. We don't know, but I'm skeptical that the breach was, you know, that simple. I, I think what we probably had here, uh, and again, it would be nice if people would publish, and I'm going to show you Imperva, uh, who got hacked a few years ago, uh, they published all the details, and God bless them, that's what you should do, right, to help the rest of us not get breached the same way. But my guess is that the, uh, oops, I'm drawing the wrong service that the ability to switch IAM roles was probably part of this. And it was definitely part of the Capital One breach too. So you might have, for example, this server right here, not having access to these Git repos, but if it has the ability to remap its identity to something that does have access to those Git repos, it, it effectively does, right? And, and we see this, um, a fair amount. So um, what you really want to focus on is uh, having the right kind of segmentation in the system. And, and folks are used to doing that uh, with TCP IP networks, which again, are, are really just not even going to help you in this. None of this. That's not what this, how this stuff is done. All right. Um, we got 10 minutes left. Let's do Imperva. So Imperva is a, a very good cloud security company who got breached and whose CEO was replaced as a result. So uh, there, but uh, uh, you know, for luck uh, can go any of us. So we're trying to learn from these things. Again, good company, solid security practitioners yet breached. So uh, what happened? Um, our investigation identified an unauthorized use of an administrative API key in one of our production AWS accounts. Okay, yet again, it's API keys. Um, you're not gonna catch these things in, in flight. I know I keep saying that, but I can't enforce it enough. And you'll see in Imperva's case, they understand that. They're not making the goofy mistake of thinking we should have been able to detect this while it was happening. Instead, they understand that the right way to prevent this is building systems that don't allow for these behaviors. Okay, so how it happened. Um, so uh, this is the CTO, by the way, of Imperva. And, and I think this is my uh, uh, case study for like how to do this right if you get breached. Like, like really share information, um, explain things, and explain what you're doing. And that's exactly what they did. So kudos to Imperva. Um, essentially, they were migrating databases from managed databases to RDS, which is a AWS managed relational database, extremely secure service. If you do it right, doing it right looks like nothing you've thought about in the data center. And they got uh, burned by that. So some key decisions made during the AWS evaluation process taken together allowed information to be exfiltrated from a database snapshot. I, I, that's honest. We did wrong things. We made bad decisions on design. And that led to database uh, exfiltration, not from a running database, but from a snapshot of a database, okay? So uh, the errors, according to them, were one, we created a database snapshot for testing. Now we know from this breach that it was production customer data that was in this. So um, I've worked in national security environments where you are literally not allowed any production data outside of the production enclave, 
where you know your test data is all manufactured data. Um, that is an unpopular thing to do because it's very expensive from both a uh, time and cost perspective. A, a lot of folks, according to one survey uh, that Drew found, I don't remember uh, exactly which one, something like 84% of organizations do have production data in test. And, and, and it's not because they're lazy, it's because they're trying to catch bugs before they hit production. So, so but they did that, they created that. Okay, uh, mistake number two, an internal compute instance, highlighted here, uh, that we created was accessible from the outside world and it contained an AWS API key. Okay, done properly, any compute instance through the metadata service or through a secrets manager will have temporal access to, we'll have access to API keys that for some period of time, based on the rotation of those things, uh, will be valid. So uh, uh, that's not one you can like fully solve. You can try to prevent the initial penetration, but you, you should architect assuming that you can't. All right, uh, three, this compute instance was compromised and the AWS API key was stolen. Yeah, the hacker didn't care about the compute instance. They cared about the API key. Nobody cares about your operating system anymore. Nobody cares about your local disks, not in cloud. They're going after your you know, cloud storage accounts, uh, which you don't even have access to operating systems on that. So um, yet again, uh, in this case. And four, the AWS API key was used to access the snapshot, not the database, the snapshot. All right, I've got five minutes. So um, this will probably be the last one we do. Um, let's switch to whiteboard real quick. And I'll just erase all this stuff except for the hacker. We still have a hacker. And in this case, our hacker has gotten into, right, we said a, uh, we'll call it EC2 again, it could have been a container. They got into uh, a server that was, in this case, we know from what I'll show you in a minute, that it was an orphaned piece of infrastructure and therefore probably hadn't been patched in a while. This is an extremely common problem in the cloud. Um, and from there, did they access the database? The RDS database? Anyone? We don't have the chattiest crowd today. Uh, no, they didn't. Uh, they did not do this. They didn't maybe even try that because who cares? What they did do is go for the snapshots that were being uh, accumulated behind that database. So in, in the cloud world, uh, in the data center world, it would be really weird for hackers to go hard at backup systems because everyone has different backup systems and so on. In the cloud world, these are very consistent APIs uh, for things like database snapshots and database snapshots are actually stored in S3. And so you can do out of band, you know, uh, AWS back channel uh, uh, duplication of these snapshots into things like, you know, other AWS accounts. So again, the problem really isn't over here. Like this, this can happen. The problem is in the permissions allowing access to these snapshots. Um, so let's look at what Twitch did to uh, not have this happen again. And, and their corrective actions are excellent too. So I just can't, can't praise them enough in this. All right, the steps we've taken since this incident to uh, improve our security protocols include, okay, protocols meaning stuff you have to do all the time. Uh, one, applying tighter security access controls. That can mean anything, sounds good, but probably good. All right, uh, two, increasing audit of snapshot access. This is a form of misconfiguration scanning, looking for access to snapshots that is unneeded in the test environment here, okay? So those of you who are thinking, well, if I run a lot of controls in production, I'll be safe. 
hackers actually tend to prefer dev and test if you have real data there because you probably have less controls on it. So uh, don't think that is that is going to help you too much. All right, uh, but but good on them for increasing that. This should be happening 24 seven. This should be happening all the time that you are aware of potential misconfigurations. All right, three, uh, decommissioning inactive compute instances. This goes back to orphaned infrastructure. Hundreds of thousands of resources. Fugue manages like millions and millions of resources for our customers. It's pretty easy to forget things. When you can uh, create a global network in a minute by executing a CloudFormation template or a Terraform template, it's easy to do that. And therefore, it's easy for those things to accumulate and compute instances and databases and whatnot. Uh, and hackers love those things because you've forgotten about them. And remember, again, you can't fully prevent the initial penetration. And this is part of why you won't be able to. But what you can do is make it uh, not that uh, important um, if they do get in. Okay, uh, so good for them. They were looking for their orphaned infrastructure. Uh, we, we've been doing that for our customers for many years. Okay, rotating credentials and strengthening our credential management process. Uh, your number one friend in preventing hacks using API keys is frequent key rotation. It won't prevent everything, um, but time is on their side, not yours. You want the shortest lived stuff in the cloud, whether that's compute instances or containers or, uh, or API keys uh, that, you can, that you can come up with. All right, so good for them. Uh, uh, credential rotation is probably the right place to start in terms of like really scrutinizing your patterns, your design patterns. Uh, we, we won't get to it today, but the Uber breach that stuff was like three-year-old API keys that still had root on production. Like, don't do that stuff, okay? All right, uh, they put stuff behind a VPN. All right, that's cool. Uh, and then increasing the frequency of infrastructure scanning, that should be, again, 24-7. So um, we're up on time now. Uh, I'm going to really quickly flip through a few more slides and then we'll get to questions if we have any. Okay. Um, Drew made all these nice slides for me. I, I, I should use them. So, so we think that the uh, five fundamentals are to focus on prevention and secure design. Uh, that's a theme I've been kind of hammering on through this whole thing. All of these breaches were due to flaws in design, in development not to uh, lack of security monitoring, okay? And to do that, you've got to empower, uh, oh, sorry, I started on the wrong one. First is know your environment. I already covered that, so I kind of jumped to the next one. So focus on prevention and secure design. Um, this stuff has to be baked in through the entire SDLC. So the ability to do things, and this is what we do for a living and have for years at Feud, now Sneak, is tell you where you are making these kinds of design errors so that you can, you can fix them. But it has to be all the way through uh, the SDLC. The way you do that is by uh, empowering developers with tooling, not with meetings, not with education. You cannot train people out of this problem. You have to provide them automation and tooling uh, that tells them where um, where to, uh, you know, things have gotten in, into any kind of trouble. Um, and this is all glued together with policy as code. Uh, I mentioned earlier, the hackers are uh, uh, going after things in a completely automated way. Like there is no security and obscurity anymore. If you have a internet facing endpoint, it's being scrutinized. And therefore your, your security policies, your, which are where you embed the knowledge of these dangerous design patterns, right? That has to be fully automated too, or they will just beat you on time. So uh, education, it's kind of like, uh, I'm a big gearhead, I love cars. 
uh, cars have gotten much, much safer, not because we've told people drive better. That's like a pretty weak sauce, right? Like drive better. No, we've made cars safer through the design of the cars. And that is how uh, this stuff needs to work. And policy as code is, uh, is really your, um, your tool for that. And then you do want measurement. You do want some kind of quantifiable objective measurement of what matters to your organization uh, so that you can keep yourself honest and, um, and so that you can also explain uh, why the investment in doing these things is worthwhile. So I'm going to throw this screen up. We have some uh, resources. Uh, Drew, any any questions, comments, or uh, no no questions yet? Um, uh, by all means, uh, do do pop any questions into the chat. Uh, I, you know, I, I wanted to see if you might take a few minutes to talk about the role of a security architect in the cloud, because what we see a lot of times are you know security professionals coming over to the cloud and um, kind of wearing similar hats that they might have had in the data center, whereas really in the cloud, it's it's kind of an architect role when it comes to security and being able to, to, to prevent this. Can you shed some light sure. on the, that role? Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the role of security has to change because developers are controlling what is out there in the infrastructure. So what that means is uh, the security team has to become more design and architecture focused. You know what? What is a dangerous uh, 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 application design matters most now in security, and what that means is the security uh, practitioner uh, needs to be able to speak that language, and that language is best expressed as code, as policy as code, because uh, policy as code can run on anything from a Terraform or CloudFormation template pre-deployment to the running infrastructure. Um, and, and so, oh, go, go ahead. You know, finish your thought. Uh, if you're a security practitioner, this is a huge opportunity to move out of largely like monitoring and trying to create defense in depth and having a real voice in the creation of systems that add value to the organization. And, and that's the future of successful uh, security practitioners in cloud. Awesome. Uh, so, yeah. So, we have an interesting question here. What are your top five secure design in cloud recommendations in order of difficulty to implement? So let's maybe start with the easiest. You kind of, you know, rotating keys might be that like easy, low hanging fruit. Yeah, exactly. So we're actually in the midst of what well, we just did the first of a series of three or four, I think four um classes on a taxonomy that breaks this down instead of five there are there are three kind of layers to this taxonomy the first one is time um that 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 limiting time so uh, i had the privilege to write one of the earlier uh, i think the first o'reilly book little small book on immutable infrastructure um time is the hacker's friend and so anywhere you can make things really temporary, uh, that's good. Uh, but the other two dimensions you really need to care about, and, and I know this isn't a direct response to that question, I'll try to put in a couple at the end, uh, but this is how I think you should really try to think about it. Uh, the other two big areas to think about are the resources you have and the constraints on those resources and understanding the graph of identities and actions and resources. It's, it's non-trivial, um, you know, I, I can't break it down to like, here's a list of five things everybody does wrong. It's just, it's just, if you look at the hacks I just described, all of them did something subtly differently wrong. So, uh, and, and that's, that's the challenge, right? It is, it is a very complex topic. So sorry, I couldn't uh, boil it down to five. So we, uh, we got uh, one is uh, one comment here. The way I see it, security should be the responsibility of all teams in their own context, and that the security team's role is doing research and supplying information to others for them to implement. I, I agree with that, but I would add to it that I think the security team should be supplying code. That we now have the ability with policy as code 
uh, and we at, at Sneak use uh, open policy agent for this to, to take that knowledge and rather than putting it into uh, English or whatever your you know, local language is, putting it into something that's executable because now that can be fully automated all the way through the software development life cycle. Uh, so, but, but I, I agree, security needs to be kind of a center of knowledge. The way that knowledge gets disseminated is what's fundamentally changing right now because of all of the automation and the complexity in the cloud. So uh, Simon here with, in terms of monitoring abuse of API calls, do you have any use cases that enterprises should be thinking about? Um, I have yet to see a scenario when I was at AWS or since founding Feud, where a, uh, it was possible to prevent damage by noticing abusive API calls. Uh, that, that, that's kind of the fundamental hard thing in cloud computing from a security perspective is once they're hitting the API, it's over, right? It's already done, it's in the past. So um, this is why I was saying, uh, you know, uh, it's good to monitor your APIs, of course, like, you know, have security in whatever places you can insert it, but understand that those 700 buckets worth of data in S3, uh, if, if you had been looking for abuse of API calls, uh, S3's job is to field gets all day and uh, the data would have been gone. So you really have to solve this stuff architecturally. Okay. Oh. Next question here. You mentioned about getting the architecture right. Is there a community or trove of resources which are publicly available under this topic? So um, one thing that we publish as full open source, and, and again, I'm, I'm a big fan of, of having running code as the way to express these ideas. Uh, things that you can actually use rather than just like descriptions. Um, uh, if, if you go to uh, uh, the Fug uh, on GitHub, you can go to, and Drew, maybe you can post the URL uh, for Regula. Uh, if you're using Terraform or other IAC, we publish a very thorough uh, open source project that will check for hundreds of these kinds of uh, architectural mistakes and misconfigurations and design problems. Uh, there you go, github.com slash fug slash regular. So that's a place, um, mostly honestly, what I see out there is uh, a lot of naivete and marketing stuff like security theater. Um, I think looking at real breaches will really open your eyes to what hackers actually do out there. Okay, we're right at the top of the hour. We're like 10 minutes long. So I need to turn it back over to the Linux Foundation. Thank you all for your time and your questions. And I'm sorry, LF folks that I ran long. <laughs> you are, there's no problem at all. So thank you so much, Josh and Drew for your time today. And thank you everyone for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation YouTube page later today. We hope you join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day. Thanks, everybody.